If anything, sometimes I feel I went a little too far because a lot of the messages I'm getting are like... What's up, everybody? My name's Joe. Thanks for clicking on the Lightweights podcast. Today's guest, we have Crystal Hefner. She just put out her book, Only Say Good Things, Surviving Playboy and Finding Myself. The legacy is a little bit complicated right now. The girl I write about at the end of the book, I cannot read that back to this day without crying. If you're unfamiliar, Crystal is the third wife of Playboy publisher Hugh Hefner and was married to him until his death. Have you visited him? I haven't been able to go back. I just want to say the book is incredible and it goes into very very deep details about her life and her time at the Playboy Mansion. I got my breast implants taken out. I had all my, whatever I could reverse, I had reversed. And I, I spoke about it publicly and a woman sent me a DM and she said, oh. We talk about everything in her book and beyond. I've seen her in person, I think for season six of The Girls Next Door, we went and saw her show in Vegas. So make sure to leave a thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. So without further ado, Crystal Hefner. Can you explain how you kind of just got there from that Halloween party? Yeah, yeah. So I submitted my photo to go to a party and I was picked. I didn't think I would be picked. I was very insecure at the time, but I, I got picked and went up there with a friend and the, the rest is history, I guess. And now you have your book, Only Say Good Things, out a week ago, right? Uh, yeah, it came out Tuesday, uh, the 23rd, and the response has been truly incredible. We went to New York and did a whirlwind press tour and yeah, Joseph and I have been going everywhere and, and it's the response of the book has been amazing and overwhelming and surreal. Did you think it was going to be as well received as it is? I didn't know. I didn't know because you know I'm speaking out against something that people perceived another way for so long so I didn't know how it was going to be received but all I knew was that this is my truth and exactly how it happened and we'll, we'll see we'll put it out and see what happens how long did it take you to write about two years total uh the first year I was just taking so many notes I was in therapy and I'm like okay these notes they're helping me, they're they're healing me, and I met with a book agent. And then once I got to the point of meeting with the publisher, they're like, we want this like within a year. And then, so it, it just all happened so fast. And then you were just submitting, like digging into your brain, trying to figure out the stories of what you wanted to share? Yeah, yeah, so I had written down a lot of stories that I remembered. And from there, we just crafted it craft it in the best way possible to tell the overall story. I had a collaborative writer who's amazing. She's, you know, four time bestseller. Oh wow. And yeah, insane storyteller. So with her help we crafted it in in the most impactful way to hopefully help people and tell the truth. Why do you think it took five years for you to be ready to share it? Well, I started going to therapy after the mansion and realized there were things that affected me more than I thought they did. And it was also a time in our society when we started talking about those things more. We started talking about like misogyny more, narcissism more, Me Too happened. And, you know, I, I only learned what boundaries mean like a few years ago. So, so, so with, with learning some of the things, I, I just thought, okay, this place really affected me more than I thought it did. And that's when I had the idea to to write the book and hopefully help other people. Would you say you're still in the healing phase now? Yeah, I think I'm a work in progress. Now I'm in better relationships, you know, f better friendships and dating wise, it's healthy. And so I, I feel that, yeah, I'm a work in progress. What's your day to day now? Like, what are you doing for fun? <laughs> Day to day now, I have actual freedom. So, I you know I spend time with my dog. I have a farm in Hawaii. So random. What kind of animals? Uh, I don't have animals. I have one hundred lychee trees. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So, so I um, I'm a farmer. So I go between Los Angeles and Hawaii mo mainly now, and, and I find that I, that I love being in nature. So I'm I'm just getting back to what I like and. Yeah, what I, what I love. Can you explain what a playmate status meant at the height of it? For me, it meant like power. Um, you have the world at your feet. Um, 
Yeah, I think they were seen as celebrities for sure. Because you spent almost 10 years with Hef, right? Yeah. Was there a lot of one-on-one time? Yeah, there was. I had a lot of one-on-one time with him. Uh, yeah, amongst all the parties and stuff, we we, st- we still had one-on-one time. Was the culture at the mansion kind of like how you thought it would be? Like, was it fun at times? It was not that fun <laughs> after a while. At first, it was like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, like Willy Wonka. You go there and the place is just so cool and the parties and the decorations. But after a while, it, it kind of looks tired and the facade wore off for me, at least. Did you run into any issues when you wanted to publish the book? Was anyone trying to say anything to you? Um, I had a few of Hef's close friends that said, oh, you know, be, be careful. Like it wasn't all bad. And I was just, I was just telling a man down the way over here. Um, I, I just left KTLA and those same friends of Hef are texting me. Great job on KTLA. Oh, that's awesome. Like they're, they're changing their tune. So that's cool. Did you keep in touch with them over the past few years? Yeah. There's a handful of people that I keep in touch with from the mansion for sure. A lot of them are older. (laughs) Is it any of the workers that were there? Because I know in your book you talk about how you gravitated toward them in the beginning. Yeah, some of them actually still help me. And <laughs> uh, Jimmy, he watches my dog Lady sometimes. And so, so I've, <laughs> yeah, I've stayed friends. Oh, people. that's great. Mm-hmm. When you were at the mansion, who were the people that would really stop by? Were you intrigued to meet any of them? Like celebrity wise? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. There were so many different celebrities random random celebrities like the original Catwoman would be there then you'd have Smokey Robinson sitting next to her and then you'd have Buzz Aldrin who's the second man on the moon just the most random mixed I remember toward the end like Justin Bieber and Kylie Jenner came over and I remember Leonardo DiCaprio and Rihanna like getting it on somewhere like in the (laughs) Like, wow. I'm like, oh, that's smart. Like, celebrities just get together with celebrities, and that way, like, they're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> just keep it, a, keep it a secret. But, yeah, I met a lot of random cool people. Did you want to talk to them, or were you kind of, like, trying to stay away from them? Um, I guess my – I just made sure Hef was okay the whole time. I just – I'm like, okay, Hef doesn't want me talking too much to other people. You know, he just wants to have the limelight. So I just, I don't know, I just stayed as the shadow and just politely said hi here and there. Would your day-to-day in the mansion, would you fill it up with things that, like, you wanted to do? Like, was there a gym? Would you be able to work out if you wanted to? I don't think I liked working out in the gym. It was kind of, like, underground and old. <laughs> it was cool that it was there at first. I thought it was really cool. But I ended up working out, like, off like off property um, because I had to be there by 6 p.m. for movie nights and stuff. So I'm like, I don't want to spend my whole day here if I have to be here like at night, the whole night too. After the Halloween party when you explored the mansion, was that kind of just surreal that you were even there? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel when I, was yo- when I was young, my mom and I, like we didn't have much money and we were just a- apartment to apartment and it's just the basic, those apartments are just basic drywall or whatever. And so I go to the mansion and I'm seeing these decorations and how the house is set up. Like inside has like pa- panels of wood that's all carved. Like, whoa, I've never seen carved wood inside a house. Things that were made out of marble. Just really fancy, beautiful things that I, I thought, wow, this is this is how the, the other half live. <laughs> and then you were you went there with a girlfriend at the time. Are you guys still close? I haven't seen her or spoke to her spoken to her since that night oh really i don't know i I forgot her name even i'm trying to find her yeah (laughs) where are you (laughs) have didn't let her in because she was brunette oh wow yeah did it ever begin to feel like home for you no it it always felt like i was it was a place i was visiting and was temporary i knew it wasn't gonna last forever did you keep an apartment outside of there like no no, I think uh, Hef, if Hef would have found that out, then he would probably be upset or thinking I'm like running off to meet guys or something. But toward the end, I did start buying houses. So Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That was with uh, social media promotions you were doing? Yeah, yeah. So I was doing a lot of social media stuff and I learned how to DJ. I was DJing and I had a bikini line for a while, a, like a loungewear clothing line for a while and just started 
I started getting into like crypto stuff for, <laughs> for a while. And yeah, I, I grew my money inside the mansion. And I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell Hef. I just I just wanted to be smart about it. Right. Do you still DJ now? I want to bring my... Um, <laughs> Get residency. <laughs> I know. Bring bring all my stuff back out. It's all in the garage. I was sponsored by Pioneer at one point. It was, oh, it that's was, big. It was fun. But yeah, I'll do it again. What kind of social media promotions did you do? Okay. So when I was at the mansion, I think Instagram started becoming big in like 2014. Right. And I would, I mean, I think I was contributing to the toxic culture because I would do like the, the teeth whitening and the skinny tea and post in bikinis all the time and you know, as time went on, I'm like, okay, I'm contributing to this, this like misogynistic culture. And so, you know, I don't, I barely post in a bikini anymore and I don't make any money on my social media anymore. Um, I try and do things that have nothing to do with like looks because, <laughs> yeah. because I feel the mansion, you're judged so harshly based on what you look like. And now as I'm getting older, I'm like, okay, I need to do other things that have nothing to do with that. What made you want Hawaii with a farm? Oh my gosh. So I got my breast implants taken out. I had all my, whatever I could reverse, I had reversed. And I, I spoke about it publicly and a woman sent me a DM and she said, you know, which doctor, she asked me which doctor I went to. I, I sent her to the doctor and she said, oh my gosh, I'm so much better. I feel so much better. Come visit me in Hawaii. Like I have a beautiful house there. She has a waterfall, right? Goes right in, next to her house. Beautiful. It's called Waterfalling Estate. And so I went there and I stayed there and I just fell in love with Hawaii and that's that's how it happened so ever since then I was looking for properties found the farm in 2021 yeah and I, yeah I go back and forth ever ever since then and it's magical in Hawaii rural is that like inner peace yeah yeah nature and being by the ocean is just yeah it's it's perfect oh that's cool you mentioned once you undid everything that you had done what did that feel like on that last procedure it felt like finally going back to myself when I was at the mansion I became exactly what have wanted me to be and undoing that made me feel like I was coming home to myself you said also in your book that one of the last surgeries went very wrong yes can you describe what that was? Yeah, I had a fat transfer surgery. It's where they like go in and take fat and put it other places in your body. Um, yeah, I had fat taken from all over my body to like put put into the the breast. And um, after I got back from the surgery, like the little holes, the doctor kept them open so the I guess fluid could drain out or whatever and I ended up losing a lot of blood like half the blood in my body and ended up in the ER blood transfusion and I'm just like okay that's enough like no no more elective surgeries yeah was the recovery from that difficult yeah yeah that was very hard and I haven't (laughs) done anything since then and no plans to do anything else no plans with the girls next door did the conversation of payment ever come up for you? Never. I didn't even really know we were going to film that show. I didn't know if it was continuing with the other girls. I didn't know. And I, I just got thrown onto it. And there was always this vibe of we should just be so lucky to be there. So, yeah, I filmed it and didn't make any money. Do you think it was almost intentional to keep you in the dark? Or it was just the way that things worked? I think that Hef wanted to make the majority of the money and I think that if we were too powerful we'd probably leave right so it's, it was his way of controlling us when he was making that money was that just like a drop in the bucket to him or was it like we're doing this um well he was making like four hundred thousand dollars an episode that's a lot for store. reality tv no yeah, I think at the, at the time, I, I think the show was like wildly successful on E! And yeah, it was 400000 an episode. And yeah, he, he didn't give us any of it, which is um, which is interesting because, you know, some people online now are saying, oh, you're, you know, you're just writing this book to try and make money or you're just trying. To... I'm just like, wait, what about what Hef did to us? Is, why isn't anyone talking about that? I don't know. Just food for thought, I guess. <laughs> With 
the marriage show that you were doing, when you left and you went to, when TMZ was following you, was the paparazzi on you for your every move, no matter what you were doing? Yeah, they were following me. I don't, I don't think I had the words back then and I didn't know how to react or what was happening because I just felt like everybody was against me. Um, so I can't even remember what I said to any of those people, but even the girls in the house, you had no like real connection with them. No, no. At that time, there were a couple girls that were, they were a little cold toward me, but I even told them, I'm like, Oh, take care of Huff. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am still trying to people please and make sure he's okay. But, um, yeah, I do remember that we were filming a special called marrying Huff. And for that one, he was making $800,000 for a two hour special and he gave me paperwork that was a talent fee of 2500 and you took it to your lawyer and they advised you not to sign it uh that was the the prenup that he gave me oh i took that to my attorney and they said it was grossly unfair and they weren't going to sign it so i took it to someone else who who signed it did you have an idea the prenup was coming yeah yeah i had an idea that it was coming but you know, I didn't care. I'm not someone who really asked him for things much. So I don't know. I, I'm glad I just started making money on my own. That's so cool that you were using social media to do that. Yeah, yeah. You talked about in the book, too, the storyline of you versus Holly Madison. Did you really ever cross paths with her at the time? I've seen her in person, I think, for season six of The Girls Next Door. We went and saw her show in Vegas. Um. I don't think she likes me very much. I'm not I'm not sure why. I mean, I guess I can I can think of maybe some reasons, but um I mentioned her in the book just because like having to f- to fill her shoes or or f- like wonder why she left and um yeah, yeah, it's hard. We've been through hard things when her book first came out. I was still at the mansion and I thought, "Oh, wow, like how dare she like shit talk half." But it's all it's all true. Did you watch uh, Girls Next Door before you were really on it? No, I, I had never watched it. Yeah, I'd never been into that kind of show. What kind of shows did you watch? Uh, I don't think I watched much TV. I still don't. Really? Yeah. Movies? Nothing? <laughs> Not really. What do you now, spend? Now I, I feel like now I watch like di- the um, like Disney Plus, <laughs> just like wholesome stuff. Because <laughs> other things now are after everything I've been through are hard to watch. Like I'll like turn stuff off because I'm like oh and I can't I can't yeah what's your perfect day at Disneyland oh my gosh I love Disneyland it's (laughs) super fun (laughs) I'd rather go Disney than to Disney than a spa or something it's just fun to run around and be a childlike have you done the private tours yeah 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 what are they like they're cool you get to go in the all the exits and um you get really spoiled, so it's hard to wait in the regular lines after those. Right. Yeah. I've never done it yet. Really you haven't? No. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> when Hef proposed to you, you said that the press release came out the next day. Were you blindsided by that, or did you know it was coming? Um, I didn't really know it was coming, to be honest. Hef's secretary, Mary, asked me what kind of shape ring I like or what kind of diamond I like. And was were you suspicious from that? I was like, I, don't, I wonder why. Like, I don't know. And I, so I said, I don't know, like square. She said, oh, no, 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 you like round because when the light hits it, it shines more, sparkles more. I'm like, oh, okay, like round. And so Hef gave me a ring and a music box and said to me, I hope it fits. He never asked me to marry him. Maybe he was afraid I'd say no, but I just thought, okay, if I, if I say no, then I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow or if I tell him no. So I just, I'm like, oh, maybe he wants a good PR story before, before he, he dies. <laughs> I don't know. Have you visited him since? I haven't been able to go back. But I do remember us, you know, it was like a motor, like a police motorcade going to the Westwood Memorial Cemetery. I remember the like box being opened or the the vault next to Marilyn and setting his ashes in there and I remember like kissing the side of the box and, you know, saying goodbye and uh, his family and everyone that was there let me be the last one to say goodbye, which I thought was very sweet. And I, yeah, I left and they, they sealed it up and I haven't been able to go back since. And it's very interesting because I also lost um, my high school sweetheart. His name was Greg. I talk about him in the book. 
And to this day, I still haven't been able to go back to visit him. So it's interesting. I tried and then I ended up just turning around right before I got there. You mentioned in the book as well that you're part of the foundation. Yes. Are you still on it? Yes. What do you, what's your roles on duties on that? I am the president of the HMH Foundation, which is Hugh Marson Hefner. And his foundation sticks up for First Amendment rights, freedom of speech. Uh, there are two other people on the board of the foundation with me. I asked them for their blessing to tell my story. They gave me their blessing, which is very kind and nice of them. And yeah, right now we're doing an auction with Hef items with Julian's auctions. So <laughs> Amanda, who's also on the foundation, she said, oh, you, can you meet me on Thursday? We can go through the, what basically they want to recreate Hef's bedroom. So I'm like, oh, like a photo op? Or? Yeah, yeah. If the auction wants to recreate it for, I think for photo op. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, this is going to be weird after writing the book and all this <laughs> stuff, like going to like actually look through the things that I had to stare at for 10 years or yeah so that's on Thursday <laughs> there's you talk about the scrapbooking in the book yeah are you doing anything with that or is there any ideas of what you're gonna um Hef scrapbooks are being digitized right now I don't know I, there's it, the legacy is a little bit complicated right now I do feel that you know, if we can give grants to help like women's rights or undo some of the wrong wrongs that have been done, like I will stay on the board and help with that. Um, so, but we'll just see what's going to happen with it moving forward. Is there anyone you heard from in regards to your book that you were surprised at? I am just overwhelmed by just how many people are reading the book. I, I remember going like CBS Morning and Gail King came up to me before the segment and she just had read the whole book and she had sticky notes everywhere and pages and pages she's shuffling through all these notes she wrote about the book I'm like wow people are really diving in and taking the time to read and they care it's incredible i was hooked right from the beginning wow thanks it was really really good thanks i feel feel honored that you read it so thank you <laughs> <laughs> You didn't mention in the book that the wedding went from 300 guests and then you left. Did that kind of just dissolve on its own? Yeah, I wonder what happened. I guess, I mean, weirdly enough, I saw this dermatologist that I would go to and he said, oh, I, I still have your original wedding invite framed in my house. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people felt really special that they got invited to that. Yeah. But it was it was just because of the whole charade. It wasn't... It was, it it was just going to be a big filming. Yeah, it wasn't because of the people involved. Well, obviously because of Hef, but there was no no moment of like, oh, do they really love each other? Or is this a real thing? Or are we celebrating love? They're just like, oh, I want to go be part of this. And then how did you get it down to the 10 people? Or how did it become the 10 people? I think I just wanted it to be small and just the family and... I don't know. It's thinking. I'm thinking back to my thinking who was there. And I, and it was like my mom and sister and some of the other people that were also sleeping with F at the time. I'm like, that's gross. But yeah, there were like a few other girlfriends and what a mess. That's all. <laughs> Did you do all of the wedding activities like the cake tasting? Did you pick out your own dress for that? I picked out a pink dress because I thought to myself, whenever I get married for real one day, I'll wear a white dress. So I had a pink dress and then, you know, Hef, Hef liked to joke and be funny. And so I, I got, it was like a bride and groom cake topper and they had the mermaid tails. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever, we'll just stick these on there. And we did the pictures and toast and, you know, touch the cake or feed the cake. And I'm just like, okay, are we, done? are we done now? Did you save anything for your own, like, happy memories from that time? No, it's all trashed. Really? No happy memories there. <laughs> nothing. I've saved nothing. I've thrown everything away except for my bunny outfit that says crystal on it. It's a black bunny outfit with the ears. It's the only thing I have. Um, everything else is gone. Every stupid outfit I had to wear and <laughs> all the heels, it's all gone. Why the bunny outfit? It was just... I, I'm like, oh, this is like, iconic. 
why not? It has this like vintage, like iconic feel to it. You talked about with the black mold in the house. Oh gosh, yeah. Did that end up getting removed and cleared like a hundred percent? Is that is the house still up? <laughs> it shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got really sick. I don't know. It was like a mix between emotional and physical and all the things but i or like being inauthentic and something happened where i just it all just came in came in on me at once and i got really sick and the doctor said oh you have high levels of mold you got to get the house checked out and i mentioned to playboy the company like oh there might be mold here can we get it checked out completely ignored and so my doctor recommended someone the mold detective so uh, ron so i I brought him i'm like oh i have ron my guest ron i couldn't even say what company is from because they wouldn't have let him up so he came in with a flashlight and his, all of his gear and my little space outside of Hef's room, like or next to Hef's room in the closet, the vanity, he opened the vent and there was just fungus growing, just black. It was disgusting. You highlight it really descriptively well in your book. <laughs> yeah, it's so gross. And Playboy made me sign something to say I wouldn't sue them. And they started remediation. I think it was a $2 million remediation. Is that just from the house not being cleaned? dripping i remember when it would be raining and it's r- raining inside like dripping from everywhere and they just throw like a bucket or a rag Hef didn't care who are the people that you gravitated towards that were the workers there in it, the it's weird to say like the pantry or like the i guess it's called the butler's pantry so awkward uh, there was the kitchen it was like a restaurant style kitchen then there was a room off of the kitchen that had kind of benches and the phone and that's where like the butlers would hang out um but, you know, the people they call, you know, butlers, but it's just regular people like us that just work at the Playboy Mansion. Um, I always, it always felt weird to me when I would call and order food and someone would bring it up on a tray. I'm like, oh, don't worry, Sheila, like, I'll just come down there. But Hef, definitely, you know, it's the song and dance for him. You have to bring it in and set it down a certain way. And uh, He didn't know anyone's name. They've all worked there for 20 years. And she's walking out like, uh, dear dear you forgot my napkin dear and then they just like oh shit you know that it was weird everyone just lost it do you think other girls (laughs) took advantage of that um i think i think people were too afraid to take too much advantage because they could be kicked out (laughs) no one i don't think i don't think that anybody got completely 100 percent comfortable there what do you think was the most impactful part of your book that people will take away from probably the hardest parts to write about which were sex and death so those those parts for sure was it reliving those moments and digging into your memories yeah yeah it was it was hard to relive and i'm so grateful that i had the collaborative writer because you know around all this tough stuff we could make like little jokes or make light of certain things um we had another writer come in and help and she she had her three-year-old that would like pop on zoom and stuff and so it kind of took it away from being so so heavy um so I'm just grateful for this this team of of writers you know this is like an all women group that just yeah I'm just so super grateful for them I think it's one thing to really write it down but then you also did the audiobook version of it was that a completely different thing for you to deal with because you're you're saying it out loud now yeah it's like done but then it's not done yeah I loved the audiobook really yeah I didn't I didn't know what to expect because I was like it's okay if you cry we'll just take a minute and but I didn't but I really felt those moments as I was reading it I'm like, okay, wow, I got through it. Like, I really felt it and I was reading it, but it didn't get to the point where I had to, you know, re- regain my composure. But I'm I'm in this tiny little booth by myself for hours. And it, it was just like the, like an introvert's dream. It was nice. I'm like, oh, can I read more books? <laughs> Who else needs their book read? Yeah. But it was, I had a great time. You speak in the book too that you're very introverted. Yes. You like keeping to yourself? Yeah. I mean, I have very few close friends and yeah it just takes me a while to to get close to people I have I grew up I was shy and I had a teacher from when I was four years old and reach out four or five years old she's like oh I knew you in England and you're always shy and hiding and like oh my gosh everyone's reaching out it's it's very 
very crazy. But yeah, I've always been kind of shy and introverted. So being at the mansion was, I think, a little extra hard because of that. What At what age did you move from the UK to San Diego? I was about eight. Oh, okay. Yeah. And do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I remember moving and... I had a British accent. My whole movies when I was a kid, I have a British accent. Oh, wow. But I lost it in school, thankfully. It's weird because now when I go to England, they're like, oh, she's American. <laughs> no, like, one of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's cool. I mean, I love England. How, how involved are you with the properties now that you own? Gosh, I own six properties between California and Hawaii, three in each place. And yeah, I'm building two homes in Hawaii currently. And so I'm going once once everything calms down with all the press, I will go over there and check on check on everything there. And you're doing all the designing for it, too. Yeah. 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 It's it's fun. It's creative and it's cool. And my vibe is is kind of like minimal and earthy. So I like to put in like a lot of reclaimed wood and, you know, the water filters and the air filters. So it's it's a lot of fun. What else do you spend your time doing in Hawaii? Oh my gosh, I love paddle boarding in Hawaii. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love going to see the turtles. I can see whales from the property. And yeah, I built some tiny houses there. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I like I've been planting uh pineapples. <laughs> like let's just have so many things at this farm and uh part of my property we're starting to cut down like some invasive trees and find like really cool like um streams and extra ponds and things so it's cool just exploring do you surf no do you want to i'm scared of sharks is that, <laughs> is that, is that weird i mean i know there's like there's barely any shark attacks but um yeah have you seen the famous dolphin out there famous dolphin yeah there's a celebrity dolphin out there i forget there his is. name but he swims around and everybody says hi to him no yeah <laughs> <laughs> what island is he highland top i think he's she? on maui maui yeah <laughs> what do you want the listener to really take away from your story because you also highlight a young girl who wrote into playboy and you kind of wanted her to see what the real story was what do you want the regular person to just take away from it oh my gosh so the girl i write about at the end of the book i cannot read that back to this day without crying it's very hard because girls as young as 11 would write in. And when I when I set out to write this book, I wanted it to be the book I wish I had when I was 21 before going into the Playboy Mansion. And I think that I accomplished that with this book. I think it's helped a lot of young people. I think it's also helped a lot of people around the same age people who also dream to be a playmate or be part of the Playboy Mansion and they they say thank you like it's it's not thanks for letting us know it's not cracked up to you know <laughs> what we thought it thought it was and i makes me more happy and secure with my regular life and um, I'm getting a lot of those messages and I just I, I just appreciate that the story is resonating with so many people. If you can go back and tell yourself something at the age of 21, what would it be? I, th I think it would be some type of lesson uh, on self-worth, self-love, or self-acceptance. I didn't know who I was when I was going into the Playboy Mansion. And I think if I had a better sense of that, um, things would be different. Would you ever watch back the shows that you were on? Like as soon as they came out, was there a viewing party? I think there was, but it was it was hard for me to pay attention to them. Um, I have not watched anything back since. Um, I don't think I can. Do you think you'd ever want to? Just it's just so cringe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Would you guys ever talk about your days back to each other like at night? Like, oh, what'd you do today? Yeah, thing? kind of. No. <laughs> No, maybe it would be, oh, uh, Richard Ban brought me these five articles that, you know, Norma didn't find and I got to put them in the scrapbook. Could you put them over there for me? I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, more stuff about you. Let's go. Like, as long as you're talking about him, as long as you're his mirror reflecting back at him and his own self-importance. And I think that's all I wanted to talk about. You said you're are you dating now? Yeah, yeah, I am. What do you look for in a partner now? Oh my gosh, somebody that is 
<laughs> stable and just I, I look for healthy relationships. I if any if there's any hint of like misogyny anywhere, I will just cut it off and stop talking to the person forever. Um, so someone that is just sure in themselves and a good person and respects all people. What do you think the biggest dating red flags are nowadays? Like if any of your girlfriends are asking, should I stay away from him? Oh my gosh, I feel like I feel there's so many. Uh, anyone that's trying to control you, manipulate you, take you away from your friends, uh, just just any. There's so many red flags these days, and there's so many narcissists. Like what? I don't know what happened. Like, they're just just there's so many around. Where does somebody like you try and meet somebody now? Oh, I've. Is it recommendations? <laughs> I, I don't ever leave my house, so I don't know how to meet people in the wild, honestly. In the wild? <laughs> yeah. In the I, wild I, of Hawaii? <laughs> yeah, in the wild, anywhere. Like, it's it's been impossible. So I, I go online. I've used an app called The League. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. You get three matches a day, right? Something like that, yeah. 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 Um, and then Raya. Raya's been a good app for me. Have you matched with anybody that you were excited about? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've met, I've met some nice people, but I feel that you have to sift through like so many people that are not nice. Right. There are a lot of bad actors, literally. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the rest of your book tour going now? You just came from KTLA. Oh my gosh. It's been crazy and nonstop. We were in New York and now we're on the LA circuit and next I will be in England. I'm going to London on February 5th. And just doing it all again there. So, but I, I, I'm so grateful. I just, I feel honored for this opportunity. And, you know, there's so many people that want to have books published. And just the fact that mine was and people are reading it, I just, I couldn't be happier and more grateful. And I have the best team in the world. And yeah, I'm just, I'm like, how did, how did I get so lucky? It's, yeah. Is there anything you wish you said differently or went a little harder or I don't even want to say more real but like do you wish you said something to really assert it or are you like overall very happy with everything I'm overall very happy if anything sometimes I feel I went a little too far because a lot of the messages I'm getting are like I can't stop crying I'm so sad I feel so sad after reading your book I'm like oh no like I'm sorry <laughs> but everything's out there and I'm just I'm just so happy with the the, the final product and that people are reading it. You highlight a relationship that you had with Jordan McGraw, Dr. Phil's son. Yes. Have you spoken with him? No. No? No. Do you think he would ever reach out? No, no. He's, t yeah. I don't, I don't think we'll ever talk the rest of our lives. Is there anyone you wrote about in the book that opened up a conversation to kind of heal those wounds? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think we've... We've chatted um, Amber in the book. I have had a lot of conversations with her because she she was she was definitely a ride or die in a lot of different aspects, <laughs> as people can read about. But um, yeah, we we kind of reflected and talked a lot about that. So. Yeah. What do you think the legacy of Playboy is going to become? I have no idea. I like the Playboy is now. Yeah, you know, Playboy was was meant to stand for freedom and expression and all those things, but in reality, it was this magazine like pushed out with women in it that Hugh Hefner personally were, was attracted to, and I, I feel like beauty is subjective and that sucks. And now I think it has like a wider audience. I think they even like had a, a, a man on the cover like not that long ago, and I just feel that if Playboy wants to be like true freedom and expression it needs to incorporate everybody and and i think that's happening slowly in terms of the hugh hefner legacy i'm not sure it's complicated are you part of the f conversation for the future of it at all ever not for the magazine so playboy magazine is completely separate from the hugh hefner name which yeah. is interesting that it's totally different ip was he ever worried about i don't want to say the downfall of it but if it ever would take a wrong turn or was he so, this is it? Oh, my gosh. He meticulously, you know, those scrapbooks, there's 3,000 scrapbooks. He meticulously documented his life 
in his with knowing that in his his mind people for generations and generations and generations would idolize him and look at these scrapbooks and just think that he's just the man and the best and change the world and history for years to come he, i don't think he had any idea what was going to happen next he died a month before me too happened do you think there would have been conversations with his name in it had he was still alive yeah absolutely and that's the a and e playboy show um secrets of playboy started that conversation and i think he would still be doing what what he did just in a quieter way do you think you still would have been with him no the my mentality now and the wisdom that that um i've accumulated it would just not it would not happen yeah so uk coming up yes what else is on the agenda for you are you just gonna go back to farming once you finish yes (laughs) that's what <laughs> farming and home design. Yes, farming and home design it sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. I I never wanted to be like an actor or anything like that. Hollywood is not really my scene. But if I can, you know, I'm showing up to hopefully help make a difference. And if if I can show up and help with that, then then yeah. Then do you do any Hollywood stuff now? No, zero. I was, I say quiet for five years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I rem- then when I heard your book was coming out, I was so inquisitive about everything. Because I mentioned that, like, I knew of you, especially with our mutual friend. Yeah. So I kind of knew about you. So to hear that you were coming out with the book, it was very intriguing. And I really do think you delivered on all fronts. And you hooked me right from the beginning. So it was very Thank great. Thank you. A great listen. I didn't read it, but I did listen. Uh, Awesome. awesome. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, cool. So, guys, go check out Crystal Hefner's book, Only Say Good Things. It's available everywhere now. Yes. Cool. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Cool. Crystal, lightweights, out. Cool. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.